basis. All right. What is a non-recourse mortgage and what is a recourse mortgage and how do you tell the difference? And also then, what's the difference for tax reporting? Well, legally speaking, a non-recourse mortgage means simply that the property is the only recourse for the uh, lender. So if there's a default or forecl uh, the foreclosure getting the property uh, is how it works. And in most cases in a residential situation, it ends up being like that in California. We said the foreclosure right. results in a uh, extinction of the loan. Right. A recourse loan, which it, technically all California loans are recourse except for a few, the purchase money loans uh, for principal residents. That is a concept where the, the lender can get the property and also get a lawsuit or get other collection from other borrower resources. That will happen most likely in a commercial situation where there's been personal guarantees or those types of things. Well, although in some occasions it happens with the residential. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you tell the difference? Number one, you have to read the paperwork. You have to, if you can't read it, you got to hire a lawyer or an accountant to read the paperwork. You will get notice on a 1099. The 1099C report, there is a checkbox, line five. It says recourse or non-recourse. Right. The lender will tell you. Don't necessarily trust it mm -hmm. because it may, it, well, number one, it may not be accurate. And number two, the tax result that you get may not be accurate and it may be disfavorable. Uh -huh. So for tax purposes, the recourse loan it could be favorable, but it's, it's considered as though you sold the property for the loan amount. Right. The non-recourse loan creates something called cancellation of indebtedness, the CODI, C-O-D-I, and that could be ordinary income. Well, that's the recourse, right? So you get the ordinary income with the recourse, right? And then the non-recourse. So, 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 so let me give you a quick yeah. example. The loan is four hundred, recourse. Yes. The property value is three hundred. Yes. And there is a foreclosure. Right. The hundred difference, the four hundred minus the three hundred. That's cancellation of debt income. That's ordinary income. Right. And there are some exclusions. We don't have time to go through that, but there are some exclusions and so forth for that. Um, and they're statutory in nature, and they're all based on facts. Mm -hmm. Anybody facing this type of situation that's going through this analysis should include a tax analysis as well with it. And there is a right and wrong answer. There's not speculation here. You have all the facts ahead of you. And you can make a judgment about whether it's recourse or non-recourse, whether you have this CODI or not, et cetera. Yeah. But also, like you said, so sometimes you can tell by the paperwork. That's usually more in the case of a commercial loan, whereas... Well, it would be true also in a, in a uh, residential loan. There is a note. You can read the note and see what the rights and remedies are of the, of the lender. And that, has, that gives you the indication whether it's recourse or non-recourse. But like if it relates to the purchase of a residence... Correct then that sort of supersedes... That's correct. So, so there's a rule in California called CCP 580B, and that says that any loan that's used to buy a residence that's a principal dwelling mm -hmm. is uh, non-recourse, that the lender's only remedy is to uh, take the property, and any deficiency is uh, exonerated forever. Right. So, so that makes it very important. Anybody who's refied their loan does not have the protection anymore. Right. It's pretty interesting. So that's a big thing that people, in many cases, they haven't been aware of. I mean, uh, refi has been a, a, a hot area. Both of us uh, you know, uh, are involved in that mortgage market to some degree. And uh, so many times people aren't aware that when they're refinancing their purchase money mortgage that they're actually maybe giving up some rights. That, that's correct. They're yeah. giving up those rights. Yeah. All right, well, uh, time is going. Let's see here. What is a judicial forego foreclosure? What is a non-judicial foreclosure? The distinction between a judicial and non-judicial, judicial foreclosure doesn't happen a whole lot in residential setting. Judicial foreclosure is where the lender actually files a lawsuit in Superior Court in California, and they're suing on the note. <coughs> there's, a loan is uh, issued, and there's a promissory note, IOU. I owe you $400,000. Right. There's a deed of trust. That's the mortgage. That right. says if I don't pay, the property is collateral. So the lender says, I want the whole four hundred, And then that's really what the judicial foreclosure is all about. And the lender, through that process, can not only get the property, but also get a judgment for the excess. So if there's, if, let's say the loan's worth four hundred and the house is worth two eighty, there's a 120 deficiency. The 120 
now the lender can actually go get other assets from the, the stock account, the cash, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, by contrast, the non-judicial foreclosure is non-court proceeding. That's that simple three month plus 21 day procedure that we said. It's very fast, very cheap, works very well, but the key distinction for the lender is they will not be able to go get that 120,000 in my example. That 120,000 is forever extinguished. Mm -hmm. So the lender, the lender makes that call. The borrower cannot choose. Sometimes the lender actually does both because they can, they can go get some rents or they can get some other things. They, they do it what they call in parallel. Mm -hmm. So, but most, most often you'll see non-judicial in the residential setting. Okay. Um, again, our time is uh, rapidly coming up here, but uh, a little highlight. Are all mortgages for principal residences eligible for exclusion under the Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act, the federal uh, you know, uh, act for principal residences and so forth, uh, and has California conformed? Well, California has conformed to that rule. The rule is found at uh, Code Section 108A1E for those uh, junkies out there, those tax junkies. Okay. And it says basically that if you use, if you get an acquisition debt, which is similar to the acquisition debt we use for computing mortgage, home mortgage interest, up to $2 million, you can get a, um, uh, and, and that loan is uh, forgiven, mm -hmm. you get exclusion from the CODI, C-O-D-I. Yeah, the cancellation of debt. Mm -hmm. But not all that's actually no, qualified. No, just because it's secured by the property doesn't mean it. And, and for example, the cash out refi, you had an original loan for three, you took a new loan for 400, you got that 100,000 to pay bills or to take a vacation. The 100,000 is not eligible for that. And in effect, that's what you pay taxes on the vacation money is what it really amounts to. Okay. Um, I'm hesitant, but I'm going to just uh, bring up this question anyway. What kind of documentation should homeowners keep that have a loan modification, short sale, or foreclosure? And we do, we do have just a brief time. But what should they keep? Well, I, I would say keep everything, and you could scan everything, and then you have it on a thumbnail drive, right? I mean, yeah. so that's the that's kind of the best. Well, that, you, you have to have the computer. But the reason why I brought up the question is uh, sometimes you're trying to prove insolvency yes. and other things, and I found that people, in many cases, keep very poor records. Right. Uh, they pay their credit card bills and they throw them away. And uh, so that's just unwise to do. And particularly when you're going through these things, I'd say keep really all of your yeah, documents. Yeah, I, I think before you think about getting rid of stuff, that's a, that's a call to your accountant. Yeah, yeah. And see an accountant and att or an attorney early. Early. Uh, early is better than later. That, that will help an awful lot. Exactly. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're about out of time. So I think I'm just going to thank you okay, good. very much for uh, meeting with me again and uh, talking a little bit about this because this is something that people are wrestling with right now, as we both know. So, folks, uh, get legal advice. Uh, get uh, tax advice related to this. And uh, we'll I, see. You, you can call me. I mean, I, I've been I've been doing this a lot, and I've got it sort of wired, and I've got kind of the questions and answers, you know, sort of okay. figured out. So people yeah. can people certainly can call me. If okay. They want. So Scott's prepared. Uh, I also help a lot of people with this. So we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. <laughs>